So it is a real privilege and honor today to introduce Pastor Wade Moore. Come on up. Let's give him a warm pack of Durham welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, uh, uh, Carl, for that introduction. Very good to see everybody uh, and to meet new people. I've been here before, and uh, what a great uh, honor it is to be here. Uh, John Todd, I think you was president back then. What was that 1950? When were we here? No, <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I've seen a few presidents uh, uh, here, but uh, thank you all again. And, and what a joy it is to be able to come back and have been watching the schedule and like, wow, seeing the speakers. And I'm like, man, what am I doing here? I mean, you got Congressman Estes and you got Mayor Wu and you got uh, 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 U.S. Senator Roger Marshall. And I'm thinking then they put me on this thing. I'm like, wow. So I'm glad to be here today. And, and to talk about education, talk about education. Uh, as he already mentioned, I am a pastor. I pastor a church, so you may hear a little preaching, may hear a little uh, information given. And you know, sometimes preachers are long-winded, but I, we're gonna leave some time for some question and answer, all right? Now, since I am an educator, I'm gonna open you up with a, with a, with a good uh, school joke. Good, uh, get your minds going after that great meal. And, and I put this forth to our students the other day, and I asked them, why was the math book so angry? Why was the math book so angry? Do, 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 do. There was division somewhere. That's a good one. I like that one. Yeah, uh, because it was full of problems it couldn't solve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so I, I, t I tell them, don't walk around like a math book. You know, we got a lot of problems, but all problems, I believe, can be solved. Every problem. We'll, we'll never run into a problem that cannot be solved. Every problem has an answer to it. And, and I thank God for, for his word. I thank God for his spirit, his wisdom, and his knowledge, uh, his resources, people, God's resources, that can help us solve problems. And, and uh, 10 years ago, uh, some of you in this room and some that are, that are members uh, and past members helped us solve a problem. Uh, the education system uh, was failing our children here in Wichita, in Kansas and around the country. And it seemed to be no answer. Nobody had provided an answer for it. Really, I don't think anybody really challenged it the way it needed to be challenged and told them what needed to be uh, uh, said. And so 10 years ago, uh, we gathered together and we solved a problem. Uh, there were children falling through the cracks, children being promoted that could not read, ended up in the sixth grade, can't read. Children uh, in the third grade, when you give them a test and put the alphabet in front of them, they're like, what is that? And, and children with behavior problems. So we had a real uh, problem. But 10 years ago, we were able to solve that problem. And, and one of my things is, if we don't stay on top of things uh, and we keep working at it, those problems have a tendency to come back. And so uh, we have to stay on top of things. You know, uh, We think, man, we got the answer. And we may have the answer for that time, but we have to stay on top of things. And, 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 and not let those problems come back. And I believe, you know, we, we have a tendency to do that in life. We have a tendency to do it in politics and, and everywhere. And now, man, we got a problem <laughs> that, that we got to solve in November. We got a problem. But every problem has an answer. And that answer is getting as many people as we know educated and out to vote. And we'll, we can solve that problem. All right, so we got the joke of the day out, so y'all feel free to go use that everywhere, go home today. If your grandkids come over this weekend, hey, tell them that, and they're going to think you're the greatest grandparent ever, all right? So, so we got that out of the way. All right, so I'm going to go over just a few short things. Then after, uh, we'll leave some time uh, to answer some questions. 
All right, so we're going to talk about education uh, in, in the USA uh, because I believe that this is a widespread problem uh, across the nation and hearing things. Got a call last night from somebody in Baltimore, Maryland. They was telling me, oh, how terrible it is up there. And man, I mean, things are just falling apart. There's an answer. All right. All right. So uh, in talking about education, you know, in 2001, they enacted No Child Left Behind. All right. No Child Left Behind. And, and when we really look at this thing and, and see what has happened with children, uh, every child has the right to access. Is that just public school education or access to all education types? All right. And uh, no child will be left behind. I don't think that we've uh, fulfilled uh, that part of it because there are a lot of children that are being left behind. Uh, assessment every year. Yep, we do that. Every school has to perform better than the previous year. Wow. Every school has to perform better than the previous year. Somewhere, somebody dropped the ball on that one. Yeah, because we're seeing schools that, that, that are not performing. As a matter of fact, we're seeing schools that are getting worse. And, and, and so, you know, uh, we have to revisit uh, those things and, and to make sure uh, that, that what we put in writing and the promises we make, that we follow through on those things. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. I'm a school leader. Uh, and sometimes my employees forget that I am an employer. Yeah. And, and so when I go and I walk to school and I'm checking things, I mean, I am paying you to work. This is not a fellowship event. This is a workplace. All right. And so paying them to work. So so any policy, uh, I any any uh, uh, policy, work policy, I expect them to to follow those policies. Uh, be at work on time. Yeah, that's not a suggestion. That's part of the whole package of the thing. And every every school has performed better than the previous year. Now, <clears throat> there's business owners in here. If you've got a business, raise your hand. You're in business. Yeah. Now, you realize the importance of getting better every year. Why? Because competition is coming. There's somebody out there that's dreaming just like you were dreaming. There's another business that's coming up. All right. Uh, people are, are changing their likes and dislikes all the time. So as a business owner, you realize, man, I got to get better this year or else what? I'm going to be irrelevant or I'm going to be out of business. And so that's what's happened in the educational system is that they, they have not performed better than the previous year. And somebody needs to be tracking this stuff, checking it and reporting on it rather than hiding it. And then uh, I talk about assessments. You know, every child that comes to our school, I ask them, did you take an assessment last year? Yes. I talked to the parents. Uh, did, did anybody share any any of the results of the assessment with you? And they like, no. So why are we doing assessments if it's not to share this with this child, with this family, to make sure they understand where this child is lacking and what they uh, need to do in order to help this child get better? All right. So so we missed it on a few points right there. Now, our educational system. Uh, types of schools uh, in, in the United States. We have uh, public schools, private schools, and then we have uh, homeschooling. All right. Public schools, that's the majority type schools in the nation. Uh, majority of student enrollment, uh, 49 million. But I'd say there's more than that. No tuition fee required, depend on local, state, federal funding, and uh, they are free from religion, all right? You got charter schools and magnet schools that fall in there, and then you have private schools. They're religious, non-sectarian schools, uh, minority of students, they say six million, but it's growing every year, growing every year, all right? Uh, require tuition fee, not required, but we work with students, uh, depend on religious organization endowments, uh, grand uh, and donations. All right. We have independent schools, parochial schools, proprietary schools. Those fall into the private school uh, 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 category. 
And then we have homeschooling, online tutoring, family or private tutor, practice family religious and moral values. They follow state curriculum and family requirements. In some cases, homeschool students have to face state administered placement tests, but don't have, we don't have to, it's not required. And it's a growing number of students. And I'm watching a growing number of students uh, and families that are turning to homeschooling and they are turning to uh, alternatives versus the public school system. Man, uh, you know, our school is a kindergarten through eighth grade school. And in the past, it was the kindergarten through fourth grade that outweighed the fifth through eighth grade. But now we have more fifth through eighth graders than we do kindergarten through fourth graders. Because the older the child gets, the less the family wants them going to public schools where there's fights every day, uh, kids are not learning, and also getting so many requests for high school, for high school. Uh, had a parent, matter of fact, call me yesterday and, and say, you know, uh, my children went to urban prep can, uh, through eighth grade and uh, they struggled, they really struggled. But after eighth grade, we were able to talk to the independent school and they had a, um, uh, a program to help children uh, that, that, were, that were behind and got the family in the school, got the family uh, um, uh, scholarships and everything so the children could attend and they were getting the right care that they need. Wow, something happened. Parents let down, kids are out of school. Kids are out of school. And now they're in high school, you know, and, and now they're saying, hey, can you help us out? Can the kids come back to school there? Well, we're trying to build a high school. We, we did all this work and, and making sure that these children would be set for success. And sometimes the parents will have these letdowns uh, because then after the first year at Independent, they want to try public school. And I begged them, please don't put your daughter in this public school and just put her out there and let her go freely. It will not work. And now her life is almost destroyed. And now we're getting calls, please, please take her back. All right. Now, uh, schools are seeing a, a big increase, a huge increase in micro schooling, micro schooling. Uh, I'm probably many of you know Delena Wallace. She's probably been here uh, from WISE and, and seeing a huge surge in micro schooling and private school and religious schools here in Kansas and particularly here in Wichita, which is refreshing to me because I feel like I'm on a journey uh, to evangelize and to get as many faith based people to start a school as possible. All right. And that's where. Things, yes, are going to change. You know, uh, our kids go to school. Expected growth and development. Expected growth and development. Now, I'm going to start at the bottom, and, and we're going to count these years. This is expected growth and development. So a child enters into school, a, 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 a organization, business, whatever you want to call it, school. So at preschool, uh, two, they spend two years there and then kindergarten they spend two more years and then from there they go to elementary school and spend five years all right and then in junior high or middle school they'll spend three years and then high school four years so how many years is that total let's see seven twelve fourteen six at sixteen years sixteen years in this organization and what we're finding out is that after 16 years, or even uh, after nine years or 12 years in this organization, they are still lacking, still lacking. And some of them have not grown since there. And they're coming here uh, two, four, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 years, and they are stuck here and still can't read, can't produce, can't do anything. Now, if you had an employee and your employee worked for you and you gave them regular training, regular assessments and opportunities to grow. And then after 16 years with your company, your business, that employee is on the same level. 
I mean, I've given you testing opportunities. I've given you materials. I've given you opportunities to grow. I've given you support. I've given you tutoring. I've put you with other people. And, and, and you're the same person. <laughs> you know, let's say that you hired them to drive a forklift. And, and, and the only thing, you know, on day one, you taught them how, how to put the key, where to put the key. All right. And then 16 years later, that's the only thing they know about that forklift is where to put the key. Now, would you have kept that employee around? No, no, no. Being in the same system, point I'm making is that kids are in the same system for all these years, but they're still stuck in these years. So something is wrong there and changes have to be made. Now we talk about uh, assessments. Uh, an assessment is done through visual arts. You give them tests through visual arts. Uh, observation, essays, interviews, performance levels, or performance tasks, uh, reading, writing tests, attitude tests, which is a big one for me, and standardized tests. You know, before any middle school student, which is sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, uh, before I will accept them in our school, you have to have an attitude test. Yes. And the parents will come and they'll sign their children up. I'm like, you need to go home and get this child because I need them to come to my office and we are going to have an attitude test. Yeah. And, 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 and had some of them, they'll, they'll talk to their parents crazy out in the hallway and then I'll jump in and I'll straighten them out to see how they respond to me. I, I, we're going to have an attitude test. Uh, and, and, and so before they can get in, that we have that assessment that I want to check your attitude. I want to know if you can be corrected. I want to know if you can be led. I want to know if, if you can obey. I want to know, can you get along with people? Are you willing to try? Are you willing to give this a chance? Are you willing to work with us? All right. So assessments are good. And, and you know, our school has a, a zero tolerance for fighting. Zero tolerance for fighting. If you fight, throw a punch. Uh, I told them we don't have to go through all the red tape. We don't have to hire psychologists, psychiatrists, anything like that. I take you to the door. You sit outside on the bench and I call your parents and they come pick you up. All right. Because you're not going to disrupt the school. And so I had a new student this year, seventh grader, and he comes in and he's all mad, wrinkle in his forehead. I'm too young to be looking like that. And uh, he's, he's challenging students and, and he tells some students that I, I want to go in the bathroom and fight you. Like, wow, okay. And so the students come back and tell me that this kid is saying he want to go in the bathroom and fight people. And uh, he's bullying us. So I call him into my office, remind him of the attitude test that we did in the beginning. And if he wanted to stay in my school, that he had to, to adjust his attitude. And he, he wanted to fight everybody. And so I was going to see how bad he really was. And I said, so you want to fight? He like, yeah. I said, hold on, let me get my phone. I'm going to schedule you a fight. <laughs> he said what I said you want to fight everybody I'm going to schedule you a fight I know a guy that has some kids and I'm going to schedule you a fight <laughs> he's like what <laughs> and so I got and I called his boxing coach <laughs> and I said hey coach I got a kid that says he want to fight <laughs> and I said I want to schedule him a fight you know what this kid did? He straightened up. <laughs> he straightened up. Now, I'm glad that we have the, uh, the, uh, the, the leeway to do things like that and not have to go through all of this red tape and all this here stuff when we know where this child is. And uh, I, I sent him home for a couple of days and told him to adjust his attitude. And so he came back to school uh, Tuesday and he walked in, he kind of looked at me like, yep, I'm for real about this thing, but hadn't heard anything out of him since then. All right. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, if we just let kids go and all this red tape and man, you got to do all these tests and uh, bring in psychologists and psychiatrists and all this stuff before you can do anything, man, we've lost these kids. And so I'm grateful that we can do things like that. And I've got a paddle. Y'all remember the old wooden paddles? Yeah. 
Uh, David raised his hand really. So you're familiar with it in a lot of ways. Yes. And, and, and that's what we had when we were growing up was that paddle. And, and uh, I've got one hanging up in my school and the kids come in and they see it. And I said, no, that's for the parents. <laughs> I'm not going to use it. That's there when the parents need it. And, and uh, I said, I got a room. I take them in there. I said, we look out so that the police, DCF, nobody comes. And it's just you and your parent in that room. <laughs> yes. And, and, and somehow kids start straightening up when you do things like that. And they stay focused when you do things like that. And so, so we have to let kids know. Now, uh, how do you define assessment? Assessment, it, it, it's a process. What's a, pro a process? A series of events that lead to a desired outcome. So assessment is a process in which the teacher engages in collecting evidence to make informed decisions to improve student learning. Pretty simple, all right? The teacher engages in collecting evidence to make informed decisions to improve student learning. The teacher is the one that's closest to this student. They know what's going on with this student all the time. So that assessment should be done uh, with, with, that, with that teacher making decisions on it and not letting it come down from somewhere and give you a paper or a computer and say, this is the assessment and this is how we're testing kids, all right? So the teacher has to be in there, all right, and make those. Now, uh, this next slide, I found it, and somebody else's, I don't know who it is, so don't pay attention to the title, but it's, it's the cartoon that got me. Uh, uh, and kids have received their assessments and the teacher says, congratulations, Philip. You managed to score somehow lower than chance. <laughs> <And so, laughs> a lot of kids are just, just being congratulated for failing. They're just being pushed for failing rather than coming up with it with a plan to, to help them out. And I just couldn't resist that, that you managed to score somehow lower than chance. That was a good one. And then this one, again, is not the wording, it's the, uh, the, the, the cartoon. Uh, uh, it says, we run out of lab rats, Henderson. Put this on and come with us. <laughs> and I feel like that's what they're doing with students, is just taking them, and there's lab rats just testing stuff that's really not working. Testing stuff that's, every, every year, curriculum changes, every Two years, curriculum changes. And, and where we've been blessed is we have kept the same curriculum. You know, uh, in 1969, when I was in school, one plus one still equal two. All right? I don't need a new book. I don't need a new thing to tell me one plus one equals two. If it worked then, uh, I believe that some of that curriculum works today. All right? Same, same thing, same methods with that today. All right. Now, children uh, living in poverty, it lowers their chance of academic success. And we work with, um, I think, everybody in our school except two students are on a scholarship. Uh, and children that come out of poverty, you know, parents, especially this year, uh, more parents lost their jobs, unemployed, uh, have no income, uh, not working. And, and more people are so dependent uh, upon systems and government and everything. But there's so many people, are not, I mean, last year, uh, they, they seemed to have a job, they were working, but this year is just uh, coming back to school and you see it on people's faces, you know, that they're really struggling. And so living in poverty lowers their chance of academic success. And we know what a good education will do for somebody. It, it will pull people up out of poverty. It, it will give them a chance at, at having a good life. 22% of children with the year of poverty do not graduate. Now that, that's mind blowing there. Parents fall, they lose their job, whatever, uh, end up in poverty. 22% of them with just one year of poverty do not graduate, all right? And then 60% of prison inmates, I believe that that number is, is way higher than that, way higher than that. 60% of prison inmates 
are functionally illiterate. Functionally illiterate. You know, uh, if we would do a survey from one end of Broadway to the other end of Broadway and we see all the homelessness and that's where people, uh, when they come out of jail, they come out of prison, the majority of the population ends up on Broadway. And if we were to do an assessment, just uh, a yes or no question, did you graduate from high school? Man, we, I mean, I believe that number would probably swell to around over 90% of people uh, that did not graduate. And so we have a, a educational problem here in the United States of America. And I think that the solution, again, we don't have to be a nation full of problems. There's always a solution, you know, and the solution is to give people, give uh, 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 churches, faith-based organizations, faith leaders, give them the opportunity to help educate America's children. And, and, and with that, we're able to put principles in them. We're able to teach them morals and values for a whole lot less than what it's costing uh, the United States right now in the educational system. The um, average dollars spent on a child, uh, when you put all, all children together in the United States, is around $16,800 per child. $16,800 per child. Do you know what I could do with $16,000 per child at Urban Prep? Yeah. <laughs> we're going to get it. Thank you. Uh, uh, wow. But we're doing it with around $4,000 per child. All right? And getting some great uh, results with that. And then Kansas, Kansas, when we look at all 50 states, Kansas is right in the middle of the pack with per pupil spending, you know, and they keep it more money, more money, more money, more money. Well, you know, when my employees ask me that, you know what I say? More work, more work, more work, more progress, more progress, more progress. All right. <laughs> and so, you know, we keep throwing a lot of money out there, but we're not getting any results. And I believe that that problem can be solved by turning to the faith based community and allowing us to be able to educate children and for the money to follow the child. Whoever has responsibility of educating that child, that, that money uh, should follow that child. All right? Um, and then kids, you know, kids pretend. They, they pretend until they're tested. And, and, and that's what the kids... They go through life pretending to be okay. And some systems make them pretend to be okay until they're tested. When they show up for a job interview, when they show up for, 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 for work or for the next level in their educational journey, and then they're tested and they can't speak a full sentence, they don't know the basics of mathematics, uh, they have no idea on how to conduct themselves, how to dress, anything like that. And so in teaching them, you know, in real life, you can't pretend. This is real. This is real. Okay. Uh, when you go to a job, uh, you pretend, then your boss is going to say, well, I'm going to pretend to hire you. <laughs> okay. That means you can keep going and look for another place. And, but kids are pretending to know, and they're letting them continue to move forward just pretending. And that has to stop. Because, again, we're filling up prisons, uh, the streets. It, uh, there's so much that's happening out there. So much that's happening out there. But I believe that education can change the trajectory of every child's life. All right. Well, I'm going to stop there. You know, I could go into our school. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about our school, and then we'll take some question and answers. Uh, Urban Prep Academy, uh, wow, we finished 10 years last year. That doesn't seem like it. It's been 10 years, 10 years. And so we're going into, I tell them it's not our 11th year, but it's the first year of our second decade. 
And, and so uh, we, we are, we're finished 10 years, uh, started with eight students, uh, kindergarten through fifth grade, two classrooms, kindergarten through third, kindergarten first and second and third, fourth and fifth in uh, those students. And now we've grown to uh, full eighth grade. And this year we started yesterday with ninth grade, had our first ninth grade student enroll yesterday. And uh, another great thing about, you know, I've been off the scene for a year. I missed the entire school year last year uh, trying to get my hip right. I went in for a hip surgery in August. You know, I had all planned out. You know, we have it all planned out. And uh, first week of school, I go into school, get everything set up. And then I go have this hip surgery. And then uh, I'll be out for four weeks, six weeks. And then I'll be back in school. Everything will be fine. Didn't turn out like that, did it, Carl? No, he saw me up at St. Francis uh, with my cot rolled out there, <laughs> living up there. And, and, and so everything went bad. Long story short, I end up with four hips in about four months. Same side, they kept cutting me open, same place, same place, same place. And, and they, I think this is my fourth hip that I've had. And so I was out for the entire school year. So I missed the 10th year and I'm excited about what we're doing now and how things are going. Uh, one of the way our schools is funded, and they wanted me to mention this, uh, not everybody knows about the tax credit scholarship or the tax credit that's available uh, for Kansans. Uh, Governor Brownback signed this in the law uh, back in 2014. And, and that tax credit scholarship, it gives every Kansan a dollar for dollar tax credit up to 75% of their donation. When he signed it in the law, it was 70%. We've managed to get it up another 5%. So it gives every Kansan, your business or individual, a dollar for dollar tax credit up to 75% of your donation. And it goes toward uh, the tuition of a low income student that qualifies to go to a private, Christian micro school that are leaving public school. And so I want you to consider that, think about it. If you need more information, you can see me on that. All right, so. Sorry, I know Wade, so you take a minute because they're, the people don't know your background. They don't know military, they don't know how you grew up. It's important for us to know who you are. So would you take a minute or something and tell us something other than Dr. Ms. Richard Rose? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, awesome. All right. I'm going to try to break this down into about a minute. Uh, I, I was born in northeast Arkansas. Uh, ten children. Uh, my mom and my dad. We lived in a shotgun house. You know what a shotgun house is? Uh, it had a front room, a middle room, and a back room. You'd stand on the front door and shoot a shotgun through it and go out the back door. And, and uh, uh, you know, we, we didn't have no bedrooms or didn't have running water, or anything like that, just born in poverty. And, and from a child, I always knew, man, if I'm going to get out of here, it's got to be through education. And so going through that, getting into the system, an educational system, and then 12th grade, going to the 12th grade, I go to my guidance counselor and I say, hey, I want to talk about going to college. And he looked at me and said, kids like you don't go to college. And, and just sent me away, dismissed me, but he didn't know that he motivated me. And so uh, I joined the military and, and I served my country nine years uh, in the military, got out here in Wichita, went to work out at Boeing uh, and, work, work, and went in as a manufacturer's helper uh, at $8.14 an hour back then. That was in 1989. Uh, man, haven't these wages gone up since then? Wow. And, and, and uh, started out as a manufacturer's helper uh, with, with a high school diploma and end up out in Bowen in management and was at my way to upper management back then. And I was working, I worked all that uh, with a high school diploma. I started going back to school when I was out at Bowen and got me a degree and all that. And so then, you know, the Lord just put it in my heart to, to help kids. You know, I thought about what that counselor said to me. And I thought I was one of those kids that was falling through the cracks. How many more kids are falling through the cracks? And so parents would come to me crying about their kids and, and had this vision. I mean, back up, I, when I got in church, I got saved. Um, you know, I'd never seen this before. I guess when paying attention was blind or we was too far out in the country to, to know what was going on in the real world. 
But I got saved and came to Wichita and a, a church had a Christian school in it. And I'm thinking, what a great idea. And I'm thinking, I mean, this is my first time hearing about Christian schools. It's the church I attend. And man, I'm thinking this pastor is brilliant. He needs to go across the world and tell people that you can put a Christian, you can put a school in your church. And I didn't know they had them everywhere. <laughs> and, and so I said, you know what? If I can ever help kids out, that's what I'm going to do. And years later, God opened the door, and that's what we're doing now is helping kids out with that. Pastor Morgan, would you share some of the success stories of your former students that have gone on to accomplish? Yes, sir. Yeah, wonderful. Yes, and, and we, we've had an opportunity to minister to a lot of students uh, the past 10 years. You know, some students joined us at fifth grade, sixth grade, uh, fourth grade, third grade, different years. But now I'm running into students that are graduating from college. Yes. First, uh, one of the first eighth graders that we had. She, she came in the seventh grade was mad at her mom for taking her out of public school and putting her in this small private school. And man, she fought it, fought it, fought it. But then she, she fell in love with it. Then uh, she goes on and she graduated from Langston University two years ago and, and she's doing great now. So we add her. Uh, there's another student um, that uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was at Bradley Fair at a literacy thing we were doing and she comes up to me, she said, you don't know who I am, do you? I'm like, yeah, I know who you are, you're Michaela. I remember all of our students. That's one of the things I do every year, learn every student by name. And I said, you're Michaela. And, and I remember Michaela coming to us and she hated to read, could not read. That's why her mom brought her to us. And so Michaela learned how to read at Urban Prep. And Michaela kept her head in books to where she would walk down the hallway and not pay people any attention, but she'd just be reading. <laughs> And you tell Michaela, hey, look up. And so uh, Michaela, when she's finished with us in eighth, eighth grade, uh, we got her into collegiate. So got her scholarship. She went to collegiate. Uh, she basketball player. So she transferred over to Sunrise and saw Michaela a couple weeks ago. And Michaela says, yes. So I've got a basketball scholarship now. So now I'm going to college on a basketball scholarship. So we've had her. Yep. So we had some good parents. And with that, you know, people always talk about the success stories, but there's been some where, man, we we've did everything we could and tried to work with families, but it just didn't work. Now, those are few and far between. We have more success stories than we have failures, but, but that's part of it. Reverend Moore, K through 12, do you have an idea of the uh, percent of students, uh, percentage-wise, in public, private, and home across the nation? What Robert, you have an idea of the percentage breakdown? Percentage breakdown. I was looking at that the other day. I couldn't tell you the percentage of breakdown. Yep. I, I only know that the, the, the private sector is growing. Homeschooling growing. Uh, Microschooling growing. The more families realize, and, and they found out during the pandemic, the pandemic really pushed parents to really look at this educational thing when they started homeschooling their children uh, during the pandemic. And then uh, seeing the state of, of, uh, of the schools uh, sending their children back into that. So homeschooling and micro-schooling, private schooling is growing. You know- There is 25% in the private and the home. Do you think it's that high to, to, together? And private and in homeschooling? I, I'd say yes, we're probably right at 24, 25%. And it's continuing to grow. You know, uh, when was it last year, year before, when they closed four, five schools here uh, in the city and class, classes are growing. And uh, man, we have got to buckle up because there's something coming down the pike that's really gonna change education here uh, in, in Wichita. I can't say anything about it right now, but we need to buckle up. Uh, bad, bad. So um, I absolutely adore you for what you do for the students in Wichita, but also you can put a foundation of Prove Jesus Christ in Wichita, which is the most important in, in, in the education that you do. Do most of the students, where, do, where does a majority of, your, of the eighth graders go after, after uh, to go? 
That's a great question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we do. We, we, we put Jesus Christ in them every morning, every morning. They are going to get this. My, my daughter does a great job. We call it morning motivation. We started that from day one in our school that we are going to start the school off with the word of God. We're going to start it off with prayer every day. And so we do that. And um, tell our teachers, if something is not going right in your class throughout the day, you stop and you pray. You get this class and y'all pray. All right. So we do believe in that. And, and uh, uh, our students come from all over the city, uh, all over the city. Uh, and then our eighth graders, what we've done in the past is we get to know the students. And I've talked to all of the private uh, Christian, uh, Sunrise, Trinity, Central Christian, uh, Independent, Collegiate, uh, Classical, yes. And, and so we try to match these kids up, try to get them to see and get families, hey, let's meet with them and see what's best for your kid. The reason why I was asking is because uh, starting in January, I went to several, I went to every Christian high school here in Wichita and went to all the rural schools, uh, Valley Center, Ball Bay, Cheney, and I avoided all the big schools during me Wichita and I got all the seniors registered to vote. One thing I did notice though, when I did go to Independent, I was kind of warned about this, that when I did go to Independent to get the seniors registered to vote, I had a very high majority of them uh, registered as Democrats. Yes. So, versus versus going to Valley Center, versus going, of course, to Trinity. Trinity had no Democrats. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I, I got 120 students registered by Mr. Yep. Carroll. I think maybe one or two did Democrats. And so it was a very low, I don't wish Christians, but Independent was very high for that. So just let you know. Yes, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, we, we try to put a good foundation in our kids, you know, so that when they go somewhere, you know, just like your kids, you have to send them off to college, you put this foundation in them. And so last year we had a number of students that ended up at Independent, uh, but this year they've exited, you know, my grandson, and we put it in him. He went there for one year. And you know what? We didn't decide for him. He decided for himself that I do not want to be at this place. I'll tell you why. It's because he knew, he knew that Jesus Christ was not the foundation of the school. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, uh, we try to give it to parents, let the parents uh, decide for that. But they pretty they found out pretty fast that, yeah. Uh, right now he's at Derby trying to come back to Urban Prep. <laughs> so, yep. Yeah, he's down at Derby trying to come back to Urban Prep. And that was his parents' decision. You know, I don't believe every school should go to traditional school. I mean, every student, it just isn't a feasible thing. But that's what the public schools say is the problem. They've got to accept everybody, including all the mental derelicts and everything. What do you think we should do with these people that shouldn't be in traditional schools? Yep, that's a good question. You know, um, with, with the staffing surge that they've, that they've had in traditional schools, that's where all the money has gone, is towards staffing surges. And it's supposed to result in services for students. Uh, but a lot of times it does not result in services for students. You know, uh, man, I, my heart goes out to kids that are challenged, whether it's mentally, physically, uh, emotionally, whatever, you know, some kids, they really do deserve to get an education. So within that, uh, and somebody's got to be thinking and be creative, and they got to remove a lot of these laws and barriers to create a school within a school. And that's what I'm looking at is right now, I I'm getting kids that, that I've never seen it before, more emotionally damaged more emotionally challenged than ever before. And, and it, it's, it's mind boggling to see this. And I, I'm seeing kids, a lot of kids in, in single parent homes and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm the male in the school. 
And when they see me, it's almost like they resent me just by being a man because they haven't been around a man or a man has did their family wrong or whatever. And so what I say and what we're doing is these students, we have to create a school within a school. I don't want to send this kid away. I don't want to throw them away. You know what? Let's find a way. Let's open up a classroom and, 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 and build a school within the school to do it. Thank you. What do you say, what do you think, what's your feelings about that your, your, your recipe for schooling, uh, that tip would be rolled out on a, on a uh, state, uh, regional, national level? Good question. Man, to have that recipe, the sauce, uh, to do it, man, if people are willing to uh, get their hands dirty, if they're willing to scuff their knees, they're willing to get in the arena and get beat up a few times. You know, it takes all of that. And, you know, a friend of mine in the Dallas area, uh, we, and he, we were texting back and forth last night about school, and he says, you've got a template that you need to get out. And that's why I'm on this evangelistic tour now for anybody that wants to hear. You know, um, sometimes people are just too proud to hear. Or they, they just, you know, if they see the smoke coming out of the chimney, they see the fire coming out of the roof, but because it's not their fire, then that's not fire. You know, and that's where a lot of people are. Instead of looking at something that works or that is working and finding out, man, how do we implement this? How, how do we do that? So it's a challenge. Now, uh, as far as, as, as faith leaders and micro schools, yeah, we're, we're working together because there's some things that I, I did not know anything about high school. I didn't want to mess up any kid's future. You know what? I'm humbling myself. I'm calling somebody that knows how to do this and help me do this. And that's what we got to learn to do is, is reach out and, and find people that, that will help us do it. And we got a great template. Uh, as far as working with difficult kids, we got a great template. Because we've learned the hard way. Okay, um, so I love how you do that, and you don't just progress children. That you know they get an extra birthday candle on the birthday cake, they go to sixth grade. How do you handle though when you have that child in fifth grade, they did not meet standards to go on to sixth grade, uh, or you've got them in, and they're there's you know fifth grade age, but they're really maybe a fourth and third grader. How? Are you putting them in different ages, in different classrooms by ability, or are you still doing them by age, but just keeping the curriculum with them? I just want to remind you of that. Yes, yes. And, and that's something that we do. Every incoming student that wants to come to Urban Prep, we test them. We give them an assessment. We want to see where they are in reading and in math. Because parents don't know. They're like, well, school told me that they were doing good. School told me they were doing great. And so we do assessments for every new student. Uh, my intervention specialist works over the summer and we schedule appointments for all incoming students, people that sign up. If they sign up today, they can't start until we do an assessment on them. And then once we find out where they are, we'll, we'll have them in their grade. But if it's a fifth grader and they need to go to fourth grade reading, we'll meet with the parents. And we'll let them know this is what this child needs. He's still a fifth grader, but he needs to go into the fourth grade class for math or the third grade class for reading. And then we have an intervention specialist to where they have to go into that room for intervention. And then we test them every month uh, 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 to see where they are. And we let them know, okay? So when you first test it, you're a fifth grader and you tested a 4.2 uh, in reading. That's a fourth grader with two months of fourth grade, 4.2. Okay, you've been here with us for 60 days. Now you're a 4.8, fourth grader with eight months. And they see that improvement and they, I can learn, I can do this. And so by the end of the year, we're trying to get them up to a, to a five. I know you might have to hear 
Moore. Thank you. I, I was fascinated by your conversation with the involvement with parents. How important is the involvement that you develop with parents and the, the success of urban prep? That's, that's a good question, because with school like ours in, in our population, um, that, that parental involvement is very important. You know, uh, my son played football in high school, and uh, we got invited to K-State. Uh, one Saturday, they had all the football kids come, but it was mandatory that their parents show up with them. Now, uh, this is what they do in Division I schools. The first thing is the look test. And so my son was a running back at Derby High School. And so they wanted the parent to come because they wanted to see if my son would maintain his height and weight. And they do that. It's called the look test. Now, if he's a running back and dad shows up and he's five foot 10, 420 pounds, then they say more than likely this kid is going to put on all this weight. And so parental involvement uh, at that college level. And so that's what we instill. I have to meet every parent. I, I, personally, I got to sit down with every parent. And then parents have got to be engaged. When we first started and we're trying to work our way back to it, we had, we had parent academy where once a month parents had to come to Urban Prep Saturday morning for a couple hours and they had to sit in uh, parent academy. They would learn the curriculum that we were doing. They would learn the culture and all of that. So parents, very important. And, and our students, I had one, he's a new student and, and sat down with his parents and gave him, you know, uh, that, that attitude assessment. And, and he was like, wow, wow, wow. And uh, so the other day, he had a bad day. I said, it's been three days. I bet your parents are surprised they hadn't got a phone call from you. I said, but today, we're going to make a phone call. You going to call my mama? Yep. I'm going to call your mama. Yep. And, and, and so we build that relationship with the parents, and parents are very involved. You know, and tell the kids, you know, your parents are at work. How do you think your parents feel by getting this phone call at work? Your parents are busy. They're trying to take care of you, and they're trying to provide for you, and here you are, you're acting like this, and, and now we're disturbing them at work, and they can lose their job. We break it down and make sure they know. Yeah. And so uh, uh, that's who we are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.